Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Phoenix City Councilwoman Felda Williams. Today we have an exciting show. We're going to start off with Richard Toon from the what used to be the Deer Valley Rock Art Museum, and you have changed your name. Welcome to the show. Tell us what's going on. Well, thank you. It's been great to be here. Um, we've changed the name from the Deer Valley Rock Art Center to the Deer Valley Petroglyph Preserve. Um, we didn't want to have two centers in our name because now the, the um, museum and the preserve there has become part of a new entity at ASU called the Center for Archaeology and Society. So the question came up, what should we become? And everyone wanted to keep the name Deer Valley. And we checked with our visitors, did they know what petroglyphs were? And many do. And we checked with our staff and they said, too many people don't know what rock art is. They think they're uh, going to see the Jimi Hendrix posters. <laughs> How funny. So we decided we would change the name and it's at the same moment that um, the, the center has reached its 20th anniversary. So it seemed a good time to make those changes. It's hard to believe 20 years yes, have gone I, by. I'm really pleased to be here because I know you were involved before the center opened in getting the area and the petroglyphs themselves um, preserved. So um, I think it's the perfect name and it's the perfect situation to be in now to talk about it with you. Well, oh, thank you, but you know, I, I can remember 25 years ago and um, there weren't any homes there. And, and this is located at the west end of Deer Valley Road. Right. And uh, most people probably don't even know it's there. It's kind of a hidden gem that we really want to advertise and get more people because it, it is very unique. It's part of our history and your center is gorgeous. Yeah, I think one of the things to think about is, you know, yes, it, we're saying to our public now, we've got 47 acres that you can uh, walk in and explore. We have a tremendous little museum uh, designed by the renowned architect, Will Bruder, uh, a building he says is one of his, of his uh, favorite buildings in the whole area. We have, we're in the, we nestle in an area, the museum nestles in an area between the Adobe Dam and a tremendous collection of uh, petroglyphs. We have over 1,500 images on 600 boulders and rocks on a 60 foot um, hillside. Um, it's a beautiful place and um, we want people from the locality. W we seem to be known by people from around the world. We get lots of visitors from all over the world, but we'd also like to get a lot more visitors from the, who are locals. I, I think uh, that's the real challenge. Uh, um, you know, you have homes all around you now, um, but as you mentioned, some neighbors down the street didn't realize you were there. I think we get that uh, too often. People walk in and say, this is a tremendous place. I didn't know it was here. All we hear, I'd always meant to come. Well, come and see us. Come now. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a great place for kids because it, it uh, I heard it goes back, what, we estimate 1,500 and more years? Uh, up to 3,000. Yes, this has been an area that uh, humans have left their imprint for thousands of years. And I think that in our area now, so we've got all this brand new housing and people think there was nothing here and this was ju it just, and their housing is the first human uh, right. footprint. And in fact, there's a deep history, but it, it's all connected. So the big engineering project created the dam that preserved this center and the housing that came and the flood control that this was all part of is actually part of a single story. And that's what we're trying to uh, get people to realize. Um, so it's a, a story going back 3000 years, but it's also a modern story about what we care about and how we live now. Exactly. I, I, I encourage everybody to go out to see it because um, those boulders are fascinating. I mean, there are all kinds of symbols. That's anybody who knows District 1, our official symbol, or the, I call them the kissing deer, yeah. which is on one of the boulders, yeah. right on the main path. Right, and that's our symbol. 
we're very proud that you're, uh, you care for that symbol and want to take it forward, so do we. I mean, it's recognizable, uh, that's uh, our icon. And we actually have that boulder, so. Uh, I know, yeah. I, I have all kinds of pictures. We had t-shirts with them. Uh, but I think what's fascinating is we're very poor about explaining Arizona history. And I encourage, I, I'm involved with the, the Pioneer uh, Village Museum, uh, which is another site that explains Arizona history. But you, you're even further back than they are. This is, and when we talk about Deer Valley, that was a major transportation route. I understand that uh, uh, deer, it was that little valley behind you was loaded with deer at one time. This is where they herded the animals back and forth to the high country. Uh, so that um, this was a major site. Yes, and there have been at least three cultures at different times that have left their mark on those rocks. Um, and one of the challenges is what do they mean? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> um, there are, we can speculate, are they to do with um, sightings locally? Are they clan affiliations? Are they uh, ceremonial? Um, it's really all, all speculation. And we actually encourage people to come see those symbols, think about them, visit our museum, and come up with their own interpretations. I, I like the ones that say, oh, there's a spaceship. Right. Yes, there are quite a few of uh, those images. And uh, we like to say, well, maybe, but, <laughs> but probably not likely. But ultimately, it's unusual for a museum because what we're doing is we're preserving the site and featuring it as much as possible. And we are talking about its history, um, but we can't simply say, oh, this symbol means that. There isn't that connection. It's, it is a, a mystery. But um, what's interesting about this site is that it was recorded on those rocks for so long and uh, there are so many. It's the largest concentration of petroglyphs in the whole of the valley. And I, I think most people who are local know there are petroglyphs throughout uh, the valley. Um, but this is the, the main concentration. So it's a really uh, important site. Um, we are at our 20th anniversary um, and the university who runs the facility has a 100 year uh, agreement with the Flood Control District. They own the land and the building. And in this cooperative enterprise, um, we want to mark how far we've got and plan for our, our future. And one of the ideas of our center is finding ways to connect the past to the present. Um, at that site, we've got this massive engineering project that's that went in, the Adobe Dam. Right. That became the reason for the mitigation project that preserved the site. That was the way, the mechanism we got to build the site and preserve it, yes. Right, so I think that whole story needs to be uh, told. And we've just developed a new exhibit there that's about the history of the center itself and the reason that the center is there. Um, and that will open on the 10th of February and we invite the public to come and see that. And um, what tends to happen in these sort of archeological sites is we talk a lot about the past. That's the main focus there. But we've had a big presence in that area. So we want to bring that up to date and talk about our building. We want to talk about how this project got going, how this area uh, came about, why it was preserved, um, and we want to think about what lessons from the past could there be. Um, this is a site, this area has been a residence for people for thousands of years. Um, and with a lot less engineering than we put in. So people for over those periods have dealt with drought, dealt with um, lots of the issues that are not dissimilar to issues that we're dealing with today. So one of the new elements we want to bring in here is our notion of connecting past and present. Um, and that's, that's great. So that's the approach that this new exhibit will have.
And I don't think we really told uh, our viewers that you have a great facility there, that you do uh, presentations, people can come in, uh, you have internal exhibits in your building, as well as going out to view the petroglyphs, and, and it's, it's pretty extensive. Right. Very impressive. What we've done, what's changed as well now, is we're connecting to more to our, we've got quite large collections of uh, materials in our, uh, in the university's collection of Hohokam materials and so on. And we're going to feature many more artifacts actually uh, in the exhibit space. We're going to draw on a broader uh, introduction to the idea of archeology span in Arizona. That's a lot of people come to this state to see the ancient sites. And we think we can uh, not only interpret our own site, but get connections to a sort of the broader history of archeology span here and who lived here in the past. Oh. I, I am very excited about moving forward and the 20th anniversary. Uh, I, I re remember way back uh, people who were influential and in making this happen. Um, I mean, I can remember Senator DeCazzini, Mayor Goddard, there were neighborhood people, Juana Brim, uh, Vinnie Riso, uh, all these people yeah. that really got involved and push, 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 and was so proud of what you do today. And I, I just want to thank you and ASU uh, for taking this the next step. And uh, I will gladly work with you to get some signage along I-17. <laughs> That's what we need. Uh, with an arrow pointing so that more people know that you're there. I know I've talked to uh, downtown, Super Bowl's coming. Uh, they wanted to know a special sites that people should go see in District 1. And I'm very proud I have you and um, Pioneer Village, both historical sites, talking about Arizona history because few people know about it. Yes, and we're really pleased that we're on that list and we really invite um, our guests to come. We've got two events coming up shortly. One is a special festival um, of Native American culture, but it isn't your traditional festival. It's called Native Now, and it's about contemporary uh, local Native Americans and their art and culture. Great. Um, and that's happening in um, February uh, 28th. And we have, I don't know if you know that March is the celebration of um, Archaeology Month. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, so uh, we've got a, a special archaeology event. People should just oh. check our website out for that. And send us the information and we'll put it in our weekly news. I thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate your uh, hard work as, as well as uh, the efforts you're making to really publicize this. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for on this uh, segment, but we look forward, we're going to talk about city finances and opportunities for small businesses to grow and become a city partner in the, our next segment. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Welcome back to On the Issues. I invited Chief Financial Officer Neil Young and Jackie Johnson, of the manager of our strategic initiatives here, to join me to talk about finances in the city and how we're doing and how we're helping businesses. Neil, yeah. I keep reading these reports in the newspaper. Do bond ratings matter? Do our ratings matter? You're heavily involved in this. What's the answer? Councilwoman, I think bond ratings do indeed uh, matter. And what is really good about the city of Phoenix is that we have very high bond ratings for our general obligation, our revenue bonds, and our excise tax bonds. In fact, our AA plus general obligation is the highest bond rating of the six largest cities uh, in America. And in our water bond ratings and wastewater bond ratings, we have AAA ratings, and our excise tax bonds are also AAA rated. High bond ratings uh, mean a lot when we uh, go to price our bonds. So when we go to take them to the market, 
the higher your rating, typically the lower your cost. And our bonds are held by very large institutional investors such as Allstate Insurance, State Farm Insurance, Fidelity Investments, uh, Franklin Templeton, among many, many others. And they hold a large number of our bonds and they do so because uh, of the way we manage our finances and because they are highly rated and because they need assurances that those bonds will be paid when, when it's time for them to come due. I, you know, I, I, people know that the bond package that was passed years ago, I mean, and, and was, we're talking capital projects. We're, we're talking, um, people think of parks, they think of fire stations, uh, other buildings, and, but I think now they wonder, well, why are we still doing this? But they forget about, we still have to do water. We have 5,000 miles of water lines. Correct. A lot of replacement is needed. We have to uh, redo the water facility, the treatment plants. I mean, it, it goes beyond just a park and whatever. And so you are always uh, negotiating, it seems like to me. Is that true? Correct. In, in fact, in December, uh, we refunded or refinanced some existing water bonds. Uh, those water bonds had a higher interest rate than what was available in the market today. So we were able to call out uh, those bonds and in fact we generated a $70 million present value savings for ratepayers as a result of refinancing that debt. So we're always looking to uh, see if there's a better interest rate, if there's uh, bonds that we could call and uh, help reduce the burden on taxpayers, whether it's water customers or property owners. And in fact, uh, we'll be doing more of that uh, probably this spring. And of course, uh, aviation is also a, another very important department that we help uh, provide uh, financing for. And at aviation, I know they've got a big terminal uh, three project upgrade and that's going to require some uh, bonded debt and financing and of course getting to market with their highly rated credit will benefit our taxpayers, benefit the airport and leave a, I think a very favorable impression with everybody who gets off, uh, gets off an airplane at Sky Harbor. So it's important for really a whole lot of reasons. I, I don't think um, people understand, I, I didn't, uh, except now that I'm so involved uh, through the subcommittee, that uh, how much money you actually save taxpayers by the refinancing and always being aware of what the money market is and how much uh, the capital projects continue to go forth, uh, but by saving the money means we don't have to increase water rates or property taxes and we can continue to have construction, uh, building new facilities or a lot of it's retrofitting uh, because we're getting some age on us. Um, and how much that saves the taxpayers in the long run. And I, I think we forget about that, especially when it's water, because uh, you don't think about water except when you turn on your tap. <laughs> you don't think about what it takes to get it to you and, uh, and how it is always like the airport. You have to, it's a continuing construction. It never stops. Continuing renewal and particularly as it relates to water, uh, maintenance of water lines. And that, that is very important to make sure that the water lines are up to date because just as you suggested, turning on the water is the expectation uh, and everything's gonna work just fine. And uh, we're fortunate to have a good water department uh, that is very forward looking with their capital, uh, capital planning. And uh, we're really happy to be a part of uh, the process to make sure that we get the lowest possible financing rates to keep the rates, the water rates, as low as they possibly can be for our rate payers. I just, uh, I'm on the audit committee. Uh, I just received the audits uh, for uh, your department and uh, also uh, for budget department. And I was very impressed. They were very impressed. I, I, I don't think there was one negative thing and usually there's a list of them as they do these audits. Uh, and it really explains a lot what you just mentioned here. Uh, but I congratulate you because when they explained uh, they can't act quite as quickly as council sometimes says we want things done, the, 
electronic system that you have, the software you have is so outdated. Uh, I'm amazed that you've accomplished what you have. So I just want to congratulate you and say thank you for being on top of all this and maximizing. You have a terrific staff and, and you're great. So, but it kind of boils over to her. Do you want to? Well, correct. And, and in fact, Councilwoman, we are working on a, a new e-procurement system. And that e-procurement system really came from having conversations with uh, private sector vendors that we work with and some of the needs that they had to really have more consistent, better understandable uh, processes, better processes, easier simpler. to understand, simpler, easier to understand. And so as a result of that, we're putting in a new e-procurement system that will allow us to be more strategic when we buy and at the same time make it easier for the vendor community to do their work in order to support us. Part of that is a new program that Jackie has put together, uh, the Business Expo program. I'm gonna turn it right over to Jackie and tell us all about that, Jackie, if you would. You're on, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. well, well, Councilwoman, we are very excited that on March 10th, we will have the first annual uh, 2015 business experience. And the theme is Together We Make Phoenix Better. And our goal is to make sure that city experts share all of the business services, initiatives, and programs that we talk about that with our community. So there, uh, several years ago, we had the vendor management system rollout, which predates e-procurement. And through various community meetings, the, cons the consistent theme was, there has to be an easier way of conducting business with the city. And wanting to know, you know, how can we be successful? How can we win contracts? What more can we do? And this is the premise and the basis of the business experience. We want our Phoenix businesses to really become our partners, and I'm glad to hear you're doing this. So tell us about the event, how people register, how do they get involved? We're really excited. It is a free day-long event that takes place on Tuesday, March 10th at the Phoenix Convention Center in the South Building. We will have an opening session that um, where our very own Mayor Stanton will be there to present remarks. And we are excited about our keynote speaker, who's Jason Rowley, the president of the Phoenix Suns and the Phoenix Mercury. And with the event being held in March, we're going with the March Madness, kind of a basketball theme. So uh, Jason will speak about March Madness, game-winning strategies for business owners. The rest of the day will be filled with trainings, um, workshops. Business owners will have an opportunity to meet with city staff and not only learn you know, what it is that we're looking for when we're evaluating your solicitations, but also different strategies like contract law. What is it? What, what is in the contracts? What is in the solicitations? And what is required of a business to be successful? We have 11 different workshops, six sessions offered throughout the day, eight workshops in each session. So we're there to provide something for everyone. We will also have information tables so the business owners can go from table to table and find out what upcoming opportunities are available in terms of contracting and, and business opportunities. The event um, will serve not only vendors who um, provide goods and general services, but professional services, construction, subcontracting, and they can go online and register. We've made this process very easy. They can go to phoenix.gov slash business experience and register, learn more about the event and all about the workshops that will be provided. So what size company do you expect? Any size. If you have ever done business with the city and whether you've been successful or unsuccessful, we're okay with that. If you are just really wanting to get hands-on tips about what can I do better, the really excellent thing about this event is after each session, city staff will stay behind to meet with the businesses, business owners or whoever's in attendance one-on-one -on -one to discuss whatever their concerns, issues, or challenges may be. So we're really excited that for free, you can come out and have this great experience learning all about the services and initiatives and programs that the city offers to businesses. Okay, and when do they have a deadline to register? How, I mean, I, I want to make sure everyone understands how to, how to engage. Yes, please. The registration deadline is February 27th. I believe that's on a Friday. 
and um, go online, register, come to the event. It's an all-day event with the check-in starting at um, 7 a.m. on Tuesday, March 10th, and the event goes till 4.30 in the afternoon. So online registration is definitely necessary. Limited seating is available. We're hoping that we will attract 500 vendors or business owners across the valley. So we're really excited about this opportunity and it is, it's a, a great chance for people to find out who the key people are in the city departments, how they can connect, how they can network, network with other businesses. It's just a great opportunity and it's free and we hope everyone will come out and share in this great event. Well, thank you and I wish you great success and anything else I can do to help promote, just let me know. And I wanna thank you both for being here today. Uh, I want people to understand that uh, Phoenix is still alive. We are still making Absolutely. progress. Our debt is going down, mm -hmm. uh, very positive things, and that we really, really want our local businesses to be our partners. We want them uh, to be our suppliers. And I am delighted that we have this and anything we could do to support and promote it, just let me know. So thank you again for being here today. That's all the time we have for this month's On the Issues. If you have any questions or comments about this show, call my office at 602-262-7444 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash district1. We'll see you next time on the issues.